7 o'clock and Jason is here, yes, so sir. why don't we move to the Paramount. Microphone. Okay. I thought usually I'm a loud speaker, but I guess it's, it's for the TV. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, so as you know, uh, I sat on the recent review committee that was tasked with looking at the three proposals um, to operate the Paramount Theater. Uh, we we reviewed proposals from three potential operating groups. One was uh, Red House Entertainment, which I'll I'll call Red House. Uh, the second was the Paramount Phoenix Group, which I'll call Phoenix, and, and the third was the Terrytown Music Hall, which I'll call Terrytown. And uh, the, the recommendation committee met with each of those groups for two hours and interviewed them and analyzed all the information in their proposals very carefully before making our recommendation. And our real goal was to make our recommendation to the council based on uh, four key uh, things we were looking at in the proposals. Uh, the first was, did the operating group have a dynamic vision for programming the Paramount? The second was, um, did they have an operating structure that would make the Paramount sound financially? Uh, the third was, did they have a strong financial plan to operate the Paramount? And the fourth was the experience of the management team uh, proposing to operate the Paramount. Uh, and we thought that those four things were key in terms of making a recommendation over which group could uh, make the Paramount a leading cultural destination in the Hudson Valley. So uh, our committee um, met and, uh, and we've had a number of follow-up conversations with each of these groups. And uh, be before I go to our recommendation and then our rationale for making that recommendation, Again, I was appointed to the recommendation committee to represent interests of downtown businesses uh, and, and property owners. And, you know, it is the bid's belief that a well-run Paramount can be a key economic engine, not only for downtown, but the city of Peekskill, uh, and, and help continue to really grow our reputation as a place to live, work, and visit. Uh, so after our, our committee reviewed all of the proposals that were submitted, we came to a unanimous agreement to recommend the Red House Entertainment Group to the council as the new operator of the Paramount. Uh, the key reasons were we thought that Red House had a dynamic, creative vision for operating the Paramount. We thought that their programming vision differentiated them from other regional competitors that are performing arts centers. Uh, we thought that their financial plan and their programming plan exhibited uh, the, 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 the idea of running the Paramount at full capacity in terms of programming, in terms of weekday. Uh, we thought that their, their vision um, really tied in local businesses and community partners and would be a boon to local economic growth. And we thought that they really remained dedicated to community arts and had some creative ideas to raise the profile of Peekskill. So uh, first, uh, I would like to thank um, and uh, thank both other groups for putting forward very serious proposals, both Phoenix and Terrytown. They both put forward uh, strong proposals that you know, presented different visions for the Paramount. 
theater. Um, you know, the Phoenix group uh, put together a strong group of local leaders, and their programming focus uh, was, was more concentrated on fine arts, uh, classical, opera, ballet, um, and while the committee believes that that fine art program should be a part of any group that operates the Paramount, it was a, a very significant um, programming focus, and, and we thought that that was potentially unsustainable in the local market. Um, Terrytown, uh, I think it should just be acknowledged, they have uh, a real track record of experience and uh, managing a successful performing arts center. And we knew that as we were reviewing the proposals, and we asked ourselves two questions when it came to the Terrytown proposal. Were they putting forward a dynamic vision for programming the Paramount, and did their proposal exhibit that they would operate the Paramount at the same capacity they're operating Terrytown and really make, make, it, um, make it operating at full capacity. And as we'll discuss, we had a number of concerns that came out after reviewing all the information in the proposal related to that. So again, uh, that's our recommendation. I'll, I'll go into the rationale now, and I, I'd like to kind of give, give you our full perspective. But again, the decision is the Common Council's, and uh, I hope that if you have any questions as we go along, you'll ask them. I, I ask either you know Mike or Rich as we're going in the presentation to sure. to um, add. So, so we'll start with these four areas that we looked at in terms of judging each RFP uh, <coughs> proposal. The first was being the programming vision, and uh, our committee really thought that th there's more than just putting the lights back on at the Paramount. Uh, that's a low bar, and we really thought that. Um, that the proper group in the Paramount could create a tipping point for Peekskill. Uh, it could catal you know, catalyze further investment, further local business growth. It could support the businesses we have here. It could really catapult Peekskill's profile as a um, creative destination. And so that, that is how we approach looking at a programming vision. Uh, the, the Red House proposal is high tech. It's forward thinking. Uh, it has a focus on community arts. And again, it differentiates itself from other regional performing arts centers. So I'm just going to step back and give you a little bit of uh, an outline of the programming plan that, that uh, Red House presented. So they had, they had a, a, a clear plan. And part of the idea was having a regular programming schedule. So even if you didn't know who exactly was playing at the Paramount, you knew that on Friday or Saturday night it was live music, on Sunday it was fine arts or family programming, and that was a very important piece to establish a routine um, that would build niche audiences. So uh, the, the, the plan called for live music on Friday and Saturday nights. It called for an anchor idea of themed music festivals built around such as the Blues Festival, which they could partner on the bid uh, with, with our Jazz and Blues Festival, a folk festival, Kitty Palooza, they called it, um, themed festivals. And one of the important ideas that was in that themed festival concept is that not only would people you know, come and be able to pay one ticket price for five or six or seven acts, uh, they would be able to leave and enter the Paramount during those five or six hours of entertainment, circulating people around the city and downtown, which would really be a boost for local businesses. Uh, and that was, that was a point that came out. Uh, and they also discussed fine arts and family Sundays and uh, high-definition simulcasts of both films and of opera and, and fine arts events. Uh, one of the keys that the committee um, really, really found creative was an idea of a live at the Paramount syndication. And this would be something like a syndicated concert broadcast from the Paramount maybe once or twice a month, um, whether it be a WFUV, a local radio partner. But that really has a lot of potential to raise the profile of Peak Skill. Uh, you know, a, a live concert series out over the air was a very <coughs> unique idea. Uh, Red House proposes 80 events in year one, and they propose moving to 200 events in year two. Uh, and that was compared in the other proposals to Terrytown, presented uh, a majority of their programming was morning school shows, community programming, and they proposed 20 to 30 marquee shows uh, in year one. And those are prominent headliners. 
and that was compared to 100 marquee shows that they had in Terrytown in 2011. And that was one area of concern in terms of uh, booking a much lower level of marquee shows at the Paramount in their proposal. Phoenix presented uh, a minimum of 30 live and 30 films. And again, they had the fine arts focus on programming, both uh, with their management and, and we had questions about the, the uh, sustainability of that model. So again, Red House's program vision was focused on community arts, targeted live music. They have ways of intertwining with local business um, and a syndicated show that could really raise the profile of Peekskill. Uh, the second area we looked at was operating structure in terms of the operating structure of each group making the proposals. And both Phoenix and Terrytown were the nonprofit traditional model, a uh, nonprofit theater model, uh, which the previous Paramount Center for the Arts was. The difference with Red House is they propose a hybrid model, which would be a for-profit operating entity and a subsidiary that would be a nonprofit arm. And we thought that, you know, it, it's, not, it's not the only time it's been done. I believe the Denver Performing Arts Center uses this hybrid approach very well. And the committee saw two real benefits to this approach, which was unique. The first would be that the for-profit approach means that the Paramount, that the Red House has a vested interest in running the Paramount at full capacity. It leads into why they are aiming for 200 events in year two. It means that they are going to have a vested interest in keeping the doors open during the weekdays as much as possible, bringing people in, and we thought that that's a real boon to local economic stimulus and development. Uh, and the second is that by having a nonprofit subsidiary, they maintain a commitment to the community arts and fine arts, which I think everybody values in uh, the Paramount Center. But it also gives them the flexibility to create a subsidiary board of directors for the nonprofit that would be ambassadors, that would focus on raising money for high quality fine arts and community programming, uh, and that would also help the nonprofit share the operating co cost with the for profit. Uh, which, which is a, is a, is a fiscally, you know, is a smart fiscal um, model. Now, I just want to make one point uh, that, that Terrytown's proposal um, raised some concerns. It was a traditional nonprofit model proposal, but they proposed putting the Paramount Theater, uh, absorbing it within the Terrytown Music Hall nonprofit model, giving the Paramount a community board, which would have um, a seat on the Terrytown Music Hall Board of Directors. And that raised a concern for us, because uh, when we asked in our interviews if they were willing to have a board of directors that was both equal Paramount and equal Terrytown to ensure that both theaters got the same level of staffing, investment, priority, and programming, they, they uh, you know, would not commit to creating down the line an equal, an equal uh, board. So that, that, was some, that was some concern. Uh, the third area we looked at was the financial plan of all of the groups. And the key questions the committee was asking ourselves as we looked at the financial plans were, do they have a startup plan to get over the hump of the closure of the Paramount in terms of both redeeming tickets, going back to people that had memberships, getting over the hump of you know, the reputation of the Paramount, so that was one question, were they budgeting for a high capacity of programming? We were looking for evidence of that. And third was, would the city be compensated for rent and utilities, particularly in a time of public budget squeezes, uh, particularly for the use of a valuable public asset? Um, those are the three areas we were looking at. So on this question of startup budget and getting over the hump, Red House uh, stated that they had seed money on hand of $100,000. Their startup budget um, goal was $500,000 to $700,000. And they uh, are backed by Red House Holding, which the principal Kurt Heitman uh, founded, which it had $20 million in revenue in 2012. Of course, that is a very um, important piece of having that backing to their, to their operation. Uh, Phoenix, uh, the Phoenix Group stated that they had, had $150,000 of seed money on hand and in their proposal uh, that they would put a minimum of $250,000 towards um, startup operating costs. Uh, and finally, Terrytown in the proposal said that they had no seed funding on hand for, for the startup of the Paramount. Uh, all of the groups 
agreed that they would meet the um, the the past tickets of, of ticket holders that were left stranded when the Paramount closed. And at the end of the day, um, the Red House startup approach we thought was the most realistic in terms of getting over the hump of how the Paramount closed. Uh, budget projections we were looking at in terms of are they planning to run the Paramount at high capacity. We would love to see that place not only open on Friday and Saturday nights, but on Sunday, on the weekdays, the weekdays particularly to get people circulating around the city. Uh, the budget projections for Red House is $1.8 million in their year one budget. Uh, they projected losses in year one of $370,000, which I think is realistic considering this idea of getting over the hump in a startup year. Uh, they also have the advantage of having re access to the Red House audiovisual equipment. Uh, Red House Holdings has two, um, has two storage facilities with you know, top of the line audiovisual equipment that could potentially you know, make the technology in the Paramount, if not a leader regionally, you know, potentially stack up to any performing arts center in the country. So that is, that is a big advantage. And in year two, Red House projects doubling their revenue, which again is a signal of their intention to run at full capacity. Terrytown, um, their budget projections gave us a, a bit of concern. They projected revenues of 435,000 in 2013 and, and 657,000 in 2014. And that was compared to 2.7 million of revenues that Terrytown Music Hall did in 2011. So when we looked at those, you know, we're not expecting that the Paramount revenues get up to speed right away, but that did give us some concern that uh, the Paramount would not be operating, you know, at that same high level of programming. Uh, finally, in the financial plan, we looked at the question of cities, city payments, utilities and, and rent. Uh, Red House uh, agreed to pay all utilities to the city. Terrytown proposed sharing utilities and the Phoenix Group um, proposed uh, the city paying utilities. The Red House obviously is different in the sense that they're a for-profit entity. And so the committee um, you know, was very focused on that difference. And if Red House does become the potential operating group, you know, we think that the city should be fairly compensated for the use of such a valuable public asset. And uh, I know that Red House, in their proposal, they suggested negotiating a percentage of box office revenue to go to the city in lieu of rent. And that potentially, if you look at their box office revenue projections in year two, you know, assuming they can get there, could be a much, you know, would be a much larger share of rent to the city than the other two groups. And, you know, that, that, the, that money could potentially be used I'm sure it could be used for many things, but <laughs> beautifying the city, you know, spurring the public art projects, but things that, uh, things of that nature. So the last uh, area that I'll just talk about is the management team experience of each group. And, you know, we acknowledged on the committee that Terrytown has the deepest experience and track record um, in terms of managing a performing arts center. Uh, you know, I, I don't think anybody can debate that. That's on the table. Um, again, our question was, were they putting forward a dynamic vision and were they uh, signaling an intention to really run it at a full capacity? Um, so the question about Red House, they're obviously a newly formed group for the Paramount. Uh, do they have the experience? Well, I think the real question to ask about that management team is, do they have the experience to meet their unique programmatic vision? Uh, and I think if you look at it, um, their team has obviously uh, the audiovisual technical expertise and Kurt Heitman of four Emmy Awards, uh, the access to the audiovisual equipment of Red House Holdings. The, uh, a key point for our committee was high quality dedication to community arts programs. And the Red House team um, the, the person that would be in charge of building the community arts nonprofit program is Abigail Adams. She's currently the director of the Hudson Valley Shakespeare Festival. She's overseen the growth of the festival from 9,000 attendees to 32,000 attendees. They currently have annual ticket sales above a million dollars. Uh, she is a real asset in terms of building a very healthy, strong community arts program. 
um, and they have an entrepreneurial development vision in, in Jonathan Close in terms of looking for different revenue streams that are creative uh, in their model. Uh, you know, we did want to acknowledge some concerns uh, in terms of looking at, when you look at Terrytown's talent booker, this is the person who books artists, uh, selects the musical acts that are going to be in the venue. Uh, Steve Laurie, who is Ter Terrytown's talent booker, is founder of Music Without Borders. He's a leader in the field. Um, and so there was a question about, you know, matching that experience um, in Red House and again, this question of managing a day-to-day -day theater. But I think they have the experience on their team uh, at a very high level that shows that they can achieve their programmatic vision. Um, so again, our takeaway is that that experience question introduces some risk. But we think that the upside of Red House and the vision that they're putting forward is worth it. We think that their vision is compelling. Uh, that the programs they're talking about operating at full capacity would be a huge boon to the local economy, that the potential syndication of concerts could really raise the profile of Peekskill uh, in the Hudson Valley and beyond, and it's, it's, that is why we make our recommendation. So uh, just moving forward, now that it moves obviously to the Common Council, uh, if, if if we can be a assistance in terms of negotiations, but we wanted to leave a few thoughts in terms of um, the process moving forward, no matter who you choose. Uh, if it was Red House, they're a for, for profit. The city you know, should negotiate fair compensation for rent and utilities for the use of that asset. Um, potentially, there could be a two year trial lease to see if they meet their projections and their expectations and their programming goals. Um, you know, because they're new, that could mitigate that risk. And, you know, you could see if a long-term lease, which I think is what most serious operators would want, is, is the way to go. Uh, as they're a for-profit, the, considering the idea of some city role in the governance structure, whether it be a seat on the board, um, but some role in being, they're a for-profit, so the books will not be as open as a nonprofit. some role in seeing uh, how they are operating. Uh, and finally, you know, the hybrid approach has clear benefits, uh, but again, it's a for-profit and a non-profit, and, you know, just, just looking at that issue and making sure potentially that the non-profit subsidiary board has some significant representation on the for-profit's board of directors to ensure that, you know, from everything that they've shown, there is the evidence that they are going to build a very strong community non-profit arts program but just to make sure that there is that conflict of interest. So I'll turn it over. Sorry, I've talked for a very long time. I'll turn it over. Yeah. Actually, it, it was an excellent um, summary of the hard work that yes, the committee has done. And I want to thank you for the effort you personally have put in to summarizing this you know, in a written document and articulating um, the considerations so clearly. Um, as I said earlier, if you just can't pay people enough for what they do as volunteers. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's but, very important for downtown. Right. So. But anyway, so. First, let me just say, uh, Jason has been a, we, we have, don't have an official sort of chair of this group, but Jason has been phenomenal. Uh, and the perspective he brought and his, his, the research he's put into this thing, I, I just can't say enough. And as you see from the presentation, um, no one took this more seriously than Jason did. Uh, and I'd like to think we did as well, but Jason is, uh, what an asset. Um, I would just affirm a few things that Jason had said. Um, uh, I took a, 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 I tried to look at this from a perspective as a longtime resident of the city of Peekskill, as someone who has a background in communications, public relation, and branding. Uh, I think that the, the Red House proposal sort of caught my eye for that particular reason, its ability to, and its desire to elevate what I think is an emerging brand for the city of Peekskill. It's long been, it's long had a brand as a, a fine arts community. Uh, it, is an, it has an emerging brand as a music destination in the region. Uh, the idea of sort of using uh, that sort of, that organic development of a music community and then elevating it with a very branded um, approach to the Paramount City that builds on that emerging music representation was, I think, um, important. I would also say that the, um, the for-profit, not-for-profit model that they had suggested um, did two things. One, um, it put a large, um, puts a large burden on their back to be successful. 
um, as a for-profit. Uh, they put, they're going to put a lot of money into this, and they therefore need to actually turn a revenue. So when you have that kind of pressure on you as a business model, I think that you have a greater potential to deliver. Secondly, the not-for-profit uh, side of it really holds true to the original um, vision for the Paramount when it was saved uh, in the city of Peekskill back in the 1970s when a group of people came together and said this needs to be a community asset for the development of culture uh, and arts in the community and the nonprofit arm of this will continue to facilitate that vision and also incorporate members of the city of Peekskill who have long invested their time, sweat and tears into that theater. Um, lastly, I would say um, that the um, the record of each of the individuals, and, and Jason pointed this out succinctly, but the record of each of the individuals involved, um, be it running the Shakespeare Fest of the Hudson Valley Shakespeare Festival, or frankly, being responsible for um, international productions uh, on a scale of the International Olympics, uh, on a scale of Super Bowls, and while uh, in some respects the, 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 the role that was played in those events was on an audiovisual side, the sheer responsibility that comes along with actually executing a contract <coughs> in a job of that size and scope uh, left me com comfortable and confident that those skills to execute that kind of a production could be translated into um, having a successful theater here in Peekskill. Uh, and then uh, lastly, which uh, I, I don't think Jason, Jason alluded to, there was a lot of discussion in the Red House group about partnering with local establishments in terms of the operation of that theater and vendor contracts with local businesses. Uh, and there were some proposals in terms of vendors here in Peekskill who have burgeoning or new businesses uh, being having contracts with the Paramount Center to facilitate whether it be alcoholic beverages, food, uh, whatever it may be. There was a clear um, a vision to make this community in all aspects, both in terms of the brand of the city but as well as uh, business contracts locally, uh, and that was a really important part. So I I'd lastly say that um, besides my PR background, I have a tiny bit of um, um, experience in, in the theater. Um, and before I went into communications, I actually was in conservat uh, conservatory. I would say that uh, it was a very difficult decision because I know the record of management that the Terrytown Music uh, Hall has. Uh, they do uh, excellent work. They have put on uh, tremendous productions. Uh, the, 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 hes the hesitation there is simply that, uh, from my perspective, um, the hesitation there is around the idea of branding this as a peak skill institution and a resource to the city. I look at it both as a theater for everyone to have uh, access to culture and arts, but I also look at it as an opportunity to elevate this city. Um, and I think that Red House has a, a significant edge in its vision to do that. And I think because the Paramount would become another theater operated by the Terrytown Music Hall, it would be a much harder lift to brand uh, the city around a, in that operator. Um, and I would also say, in terms of the Phoenix Group, I was wildly impressed um, with the, it was a very different vision. It was a much more um, fine arts vision. I was wildly impressed with the uh, amount of thought that came from the individuals who came together in that group as well. Um, I just think at the end of the day, when we weigh all of the options uh, for the city as a whole, uh, I think Red House, uh, uh, Red House has, has certainly has our recommendation. I think it would, uh, has the potential to do the best job. Uh, I'll just add a few brief comments. Uh, firstly, I'll echo the uh, accolades to Jason for expressing uh, all of the details of many weeks of work in a very succinct fashion. Uh, and I also want to thank the council for inviting someone from the suburbs of Cortland <laughs> to put his two cents in. Um, it, it was actually a wonderful process to go through because in the end, um, I was surprised by the outcome. I didn't think I'd be recommending uh, Red House. Uh, in my perspective, even though the deep devil's always in the details, sometimes stepping back and taking that 30,000 foot view is very helpful in the end. And it actually became very distinct uh, at that point why Red House was the best choice. First of all, there was a negative to Tarrytown. And that was when we really pushed, why do you want to do this? And that was a very important question to all the proposers. But when you ask Tarrytown, it wasn't a love of Peekskill. It wasn't a love of the Paramount Theater. It was that they needed to compete with the Capitol Theater, and the only way they were going to do that is to get more seats. And when we pushed them as a group, 
that if you had a great act, where would you book it first? They would not come out and state equally or the Paramount. I got the feeling, the gestalt, that it would end up in Tarrytown. And when we pushed them as to where the board members would come through and whether there would be equal representation, I was not assured that Peekskill would have a fair say. So that was a point where I started to come in with trouble. And then also, I, I really am, was looking to get someone who'd come in with passion here, with a real idea that Peekskill's Paramount could be something. And as Mike was alluding to, the branding of Peekskill as an art center is critical, even more than the theater itself. Because we're, our whole interest here is to get that spill off to help the other businesses. And I think Red House had that. Um, they were enthusiastic of doing, about doing this because it could be done, because this was an opportunity. They were genuinely enthusiastic about the idea, and that to me was very important. I came to this group with a little bit of a prejudice because um, I'm an absolute fanatic of Austin City Limits. And this, for those who don't know, is a show that's aired on public broadcasting of a relatively small venue in Austin where acts come and usually it's done acoustically, sometimes you know, fully orchestrated electric, but mainly acoustic. And then it's broadcast nationally. And that has spun off since that to make Austin a real music center of the nation. And I kept thinking, why not here? And uh, Red House comes in with an HD background. And their chief uh, person, uh, Kurt, is this is his whole business, uh, his Super Bowl background, getting the uh, image of Peak School and the Paramount nationally, getting our shows national so that the audience is not a thousand seats, but many times that. And uh, I, th I think they really got it. And I think they have the background to make this come. Um, I think, I don't think there's much risk here. I think these are very successful businessmen who may not have done this specific type of thing but have over the years, each of them, contributed and shown success in business. So in the end, uh, I, I was a strong advocate for them. I, I think they were head and shoulders above the other um, proposals. And I, I find myself excited about what could be for both the Paramount Theater and for the city of Peekskill. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Any other comments or questions by the council? I had a question about, early on you said it was unanimous. How many people were actually in the review committee? And it was completely unanimous? There were uh, six there were, of us. Yeah. Uh, six, the city manager, uh, Councilman Talbot, uh, the mayor, and the three of us. <coughs> and then my other question is something that, Jason, I don't think you expanded on, it's a little confusing to me. Mm -hmm. What's the Emerging Artist Thursdays thing? Oh, so, uh, that's a, that's a good question. So Emerging Arts Thursdays was part of the Red House program um, proposal. And what, it, again, a very creative idea. And what they were talking about is having emerging artists both regionally and in the Hudson Valley on Thursday nights perform at local venues around downtown, outside of the Paramount. Uh, and there would be a poll uh, or competition to see, this is during, in, the, in the concept of a music festival. Uh, they would have a poll to, to um, see who would get the Saturday stage placement on the Paramount big big stage. So it's almost like, I don't know, it's not American Idol, but the idea is the idea, it's a creative idea, and it's out of the box, and, and, it's, and it's tied into local uh, venues and business. And so that's just another example of you know, something that impressed us, which is they're thinking about how to use the Paramount to boost local businesses and have local businesses boost the Paramount and make that synergy happen. And it, you know, it showed a lot of creativity. Yeah, and it was another yeah. day of programming. So it was another day in which, yeah. as opposed to a Friday and a Saturday, it was another day in which something would be happening revolved around the Paramount with access to that theater, uh, with people uh, patronizing that theater in one way, shape, or form. And uh, you know, I, I would just drive that part home again in that what you're talking about is a, a, a seven day a week operation for all intents and purposes in which one day you be, could be having a master class of some kind uh, under the not-for-profit model uh, arm of this thing uh, in training local school children in theater arts uh, but then on Tuesday they could have a contract with a, a corporation that was looking to have a sizable business meeting which will again put people in the seats there who then have to leave and then go buy lunch somewhere 
on Wednesday, it could have been, um, it, you know, Thursday was the Emerging Artists Program. It was every single day of the week there was activity that would revolve around the theater as opposed to it just being a venue for a Friday and Saturday night performance. It will be an, it's an economic engine that is rooted in arts with a, a for-profit side that keeps the, the owners responsible for delivering while also fulfilling the mission of why that theater became the property of the city of Peace in the first place. Um, and I, so I would, I would urge you to look at this as, so yes, we'll have those sort of big performances, but you will also have um, a, a, a seven day a week business operation in the largest piece of real estate uh, in the city of Peekskill, and the downtown anyway. Um, it's just, you have to think of it that way. I just want to uh, add briefly that, you know, I agree with you, and especially with you, uh, Dr. Becker, that um, I wasn't prepared when we first <laughs> saw all of these proposals to um, be the supporter for the Red House, but as the proposals grew and we fleshed it, you know, because we did this whole procedure with the pedal to the metal to try to get it done and get the lights on, but also to try to keep it, uh, to make sure that we were doing it in such a fashion that we weren't going to be making uh, a, a mistake and bring the wrong group in. And I don't think that we are. I, I really feel very strongly. Um, and in the course of this, we talked to all sorts of people, including, um, I might add, the, the head of Lincoln Center who spent a good amount of time on the phone with me and with the mayor, um, talking about how they're having trouble with their fine arts um, programs and keeping them, the houses full and so forth. So, you know, there's a lot of challenges in that area in terms of the availability of grants and, uh, you know, that, that's becoming more and more of a challenge. So to have a, a group, to have this focused as a fine arts theater, while that may still be in people's hearts and minds, it's not in, it's not in reality. And I think that one of the things that for me really, aside from the level of the people that presented themselves here for Red House, um, you know, I think the, the idea of having that hybrid of um, a profit, a, a profit where people are, you know, they want to make money on it. And so that's the buy-in for them to get this thing up and running and, and to make it happen. But married to such a successful not-for-profit uh, person who has done really great things with the Shakespeare, the Hudson uh, Shakespeare Theater, um, that would be, uh, I think that's really where things are moving forward, you know, to get, you know, from some of the research that I had been doing prior to, you know, there's California, there's several theaters out there that have exactly this kind of um, structure because it's the best of both worlds, really. Uh, and, you know, you have both sides feeding each other. So I just want to say I know there was a lot, we've gotten a lot of, I want to thank people who have been emailing and calling and stopping me on the street and others. Um, you know, people are passionate about it. People really want to see this thing happen as we do. And um, I hope people will understand that we did seriously look at all of these um, uh, proposals, and they were interesting each and other themselves. Um, but in the end, I think it was clear uh, that the whole the whole lot of us really uh, supported the Red Red House Group. Yeah, the, I would just add on the process side of this, um, just so you know. Uh, we went into this with the notion that uh, presented on the table, there could be no option, uh, that we could have three no options. And that was a serious consideration right. that we took. Mm -hmm. um, and we were prepared, if we did not see an option, to request that the city go ahead through a new process and start all over again. Um, we had actually prepared for that contingency, in fact. Uh, and then as this process went on, we realized that we didn't need to do that. Uh, that we were confident with uh, the Red House proposal in particular. Um, but uh, be aware, um, we had put all the mechanisms in place um, to uh, do this process again uh, and, and cast uh, you know, the line again to see what else uh, was out there. But at the end of the day, we were impressed enough and convinced enough that what was sitting before us was a viable option that we decided that that wasn't necessary. And, and I, I do want to 
differentiate one thing because um, we get a lot of feedback about um, or input or perspectives or questions about who books shows and there's a big difference between a promoter and somebody who is really running the theater and if you have a smart sophisticated business team that has been around the entertainment industry long enough they know how to reach out to the right people to book the right shows at the right price and so a lot of this perspective that, well, if you haven't gotten a bid from this promoter, you haven't done a large enough reach. Well, the promoter's not going to run the theater. And the promoter is not going to give two hoots about the synergies between that theater and our downtown business community and our residents. A promoter is a promoter. is They have artists they represent. They want those artists to present, and they're going to promote those artists. So there is a difference. And... Part of the challenge I think we all had as we listened to each of the groups is making sure in our minds those distinctions were clear. That um, this is not about who's the best booking agent in the nation, but who actually understands how to reach out to the best uh, booking agents to bring in the acts that work in our community and that will really bring um, some brand value to the city. But from, the, from my perspective, Red House was the only one who really got it on how to really integrate the Paramount with the business community. Um, and even though not a lot of airtime was given to the not-for-profit arm of it called the, I think it's called Performing Arts Peak Scale, if I can find the right piece of paper here. Um, but of course I can't. In Red House? Yeah, in Red House. The because um, the not for profit actually does have a name, but um, what I think becomes really yeah performing arts at the Paramount. Um, what I also think becomes really important is um, the ability of really seasoned smart people to reach out not just to the things they've done themselves in the past, but to others who do um, productions and fine arts and cultural programming and even our own local community theater groups like Embark, um, who have be, been able to create really a wonderful um, track record and contribution in the city, to all be members of the community that presents at the Paramount. Um, so I know everybody kind of looks at it from their own perspective, but I do think the right team helps bring all of those pieces and players together so that we form a really great community at the Paramount. And I'm, really liked their understanding of that they could do that and how to. Can I just add one thought. If, if the, you know, the bid in the future, um, if, if Red House is the group or uh, that, that selects, you know, we would like to introduce them in terms of coming up to speed with what is going on in Peekskill already in terms of linking them into the festivals that are well established. And, you know, I think that we could be helpful to them there. Uh, John Sharp, who's the bid board president, has also, you know, expressed a lot of interest in just helping introduce them to the local business community, whether it be you know, a forum for them to introduce them and help them get linked in to, to speed that process they've already expressed in terms of connecting with local businesses. So. Oh, that's, that's really good, Jason, because there's a, there was a concern by some of the artist groups and some of the, some of the uh, already existing events that happen here. Yeah. And I told them, no, I spoke, I spoke with the group of Red Houses, these events that you came up with ideas exist in part during each time of year. He said, oh, no, we're not going to reinvent if it's here. We're going to work with them to see how we can help them. So, but that's a great idea to introduce me to each of these events. It'd be great. Um, in terms of getting up to speed, um, a couple of questions have, have come in, and I'm wondering if they answered these during your, you know, during your interview. People are concerned that um, they won't start with a membership list. And how do you get up to speed in getting that membership list, assuming that the Paramount has no legal responsibility to turn their list over? Yeah, actually, it's the only group that sat there and said, you know, these, this is a business deal. Whether it's equipment, whether it's membership lists, it's, you know, helping the old board get itself dissolved legally. And if there's things of value, you cut a deal for things of value. If things of no value, you don't pay money for things of no value. But you deal with the, 
the old issues, including membership lists, et cetera, and you move forward. Yeah, they were very clear, um, <laughs> which was, uh, it, it, there was no hesitation in terms of, well, we have to negotiate that, and, and we've got to, I would say, though, to that it question. It's an asset. It's an yeah. asset. Um, I would say that there was some discussion about whatever outstanding um, legal negotiations have to take place with banks or otherwise. Red House was very clear about its desire to go in and if it has to settle them themselves. <clears throat> I would say this, though. I would suspect that the previous Paramount Board um, has an interest in seeing this theater be successful under whoever the new operator was. And I would ex expect the same way that anyone up here wants to see the theater be successful, that that asset would be made available for the sake of the 25,000 people that live in the city of Peekskill. Uh, and we certainly would, would, would make an effort to encourage that. Uh, but the other thing I would add to that is in doing our, our research on all of this, in terms of all of the legal filings between the former board and the other, I believe that's publicly listed in a legal disclosure anyway. List so, um, uh, but I, like I said, I would, I would be very surprised and troubled if the former board wouldn't be willing to provide okay. that. I'm just putting out questions sure. yeah, that have come yeah, through. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. another question is on marketing. Did they discuss their marketing strategy? Uh, uh, yes. They did. Yes. Okay. Could you expand on that? I mean, I'm not, I think they're offhand. Their budget year one, I'm remembering, I think it was $80,000 for marketing. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's significantly more than the, the previous Paramount's 2012 budget. Um, at some point, I looked at what other groups are spending, Terrytown, you know, Bardavon. But in terms of a in terms of specific, you know, media buys right. and that so forth. I don't think they went at that level of detail. But because it's they don't look at it as a media buy. Actually, I, if I remember correctly, and it's in here in all these papers, it's, it's really how you do marketing. And so there's the difference between marketing an act and marketing the paramount. And so there is a distinction between when the, they are bringing an artist in, what the promoters for the artist does, what the artists themselves do to promote themselves versus what the... Um, organizers of the Paramount does. And so there's marketing at many, many levels. It's um, not just putting up posters and taking some ads in the paper, but it's also how you use social media to market performances, market. Um, but they look at it much more broadly as branding and not just marketing. Yeah, I, I would add, so yes, the short answer is yes. They have a, a budget, of, as I understand it, a fairly comprehensive and, and, and large budget for marketing. but. Also, they understand marketing in a different way, I think, than even the previous board did, which is that you, in order to market a theater, you have to actually brand your theater and have consistency. Uh, and they were very clear about the need to have consistent programming. So it's never a question of whether something's happening about at the Paramount, because something always is. Mm -hmm. And so the ability to market, uh, first thing you have to do is brand and program in such a way that the programming becomes um, um, branded itself. So it's not a question of, is there a show tonight at the Paramount? Well, it's Friday. Yeah, on Fridays, this is what the Paramount does. It's not as, when it's Thursday night, is there something happening at the Paramount? You don't need to pass a banner on Route 9. What you need to know is just, yeah, on Thursdays, this is what happens at the Paramount. So in, in, b both in terms of putting the financial resources into a marketing plan, but also understanding marketing from a much more sophisticated standpoint, uh, I'd say that you know, they were uh, uh, clearly convincing. Just to, to that, too, because I think it's a good question. I mean, they did discuss both, again, their idea of syndicate, syndicating the, the broadcast series live from the Paramount, mm -hmm. you know, was one high-level marketing um, strategy. Uh, and then they also discussed, you know, potential partners that they had said discussions were beginning with were babblemusic.com. They're a Brooklyn-based. Uh, right. It's very high-end. It's a digital video warehouse of live concert series. So you go on there, Bowery presents, you know, one of the leading you know, you know, stages in New York City will have a live concert, high definition um, cut from their series. So they've started conversations with them, they've talked to WFUV, obviously it's all preliminary, you don't know what level, but, but those sort of things would be branding, you know, beyond their $80,000, $100,000 budget. Okay. Um, two other questions that have come up, in terms of the programming, of course, you have Tarrytown Music Hall, who has their programmer um, through uh, Music Without Borders. Um, we, you haven't discussed the programming experience. You've discussed ever, all the other experience sure. here. So I'd like you to elaborate sure. on well, that. Sure. <laughs> um, the, the, the person responsible for the programming um, is currently handling an Eric Clapton concert um, and programmed that concert. 
um, was responsible for all of the live performances done. I believe it was at one finance. Was it either one financial center or one world trade? One, one world trade. One world trade. One world trade. Um, uh, for upwards of over a decade, I would also say that in terms of programming, um, that the the long term record in terms of the role as an executive producer uh, on multiple live shows uh, and the production of albums, I, I, I was left. I was left convinced um, and impressed uh, with the capability to sort of attract that level of talent. I would say this, uh, there's a challenge for everyone involved here, and that is that any performance artist who had been under contract or working with the previous Paramount Center for the Arts is going to have a high level of suspicion for whoever operates that theater and their ability to execute a contract. It was one of the things that we were most concerned with. Uh, and so therefore, whoever it is that does the programming for the the, the new operators of the Paramount is going to have to build on top of their own personal reputation because you cannot sell at this point the reputation of the Paramount Theater. It has, um, it owes a lot of money. It didn't fulfill a lot of its contractual obligations. And so that's a major challenge for whoever the operator is. Um, so we took that deeply into account. And, and the idea that um, uh, Ray, who, is a, who will be part of, who will be the, doing most of the programming, um, comes with a decades worth of experience in the industry and is currently programming at exceptionally high levels. Um, you know, uh, fortunate or unfortunate, he's going to have to build a lot of that on his own back um, mm -hmm. because it will be very difficult for whoever the new operator is to single-handedly go in and say, we'd like to book you at the Paramount because someone's going to say the last time someone was booked at the Paramount, they were owed $40,000. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the last question actually is probably more for the Council, and it was asked, what recourse will the city have if whoever gets this lease decides after one year, I'm going to walk? Right, that's part of our discussions in executive right. session on how we structure a lease. So I'm just putting the question yeah. out there. Right. Right. So. Okay. Any okay. other okay. questions? Well, I think there, there are, a good question. I think there are several important yeah. questions and that it, when it comes to how you're going to structure whatever group we, we choose moving forward. I, I actually have one last question, kind of like a little summary type question, but a, a bunch of the folks that contacted me ever since it appeared on television said that they wished that they could have taken, you know, there were so many different, there was very different vision, very different ideas, um, many of which were good, especially from the Phoenix group as well. And so they, they wanted to, you know, they wished that you could have taken some from this group and some from that group. Um, does Red House, as the recommendation of the committee, seem open to ideas from the other groups or from the community? I, 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 I would assume so, and I would assume so because of the, particularly the not-for-profit arm of, of, of the organization, which was, in the case of Phoenix, uh, the great deal of the programming was centered around fine arts, which were the initial, um, as I understood it, and I was a young boy back then, but uh, was the initial programming um, endeavor and vision for, for the Paramount when the theater was saved uh, and when the first board came together and created the first not-for-profit. Uh, the fact that they will have a not-for-profit and the fact that that was the thrust of the Phoenix Group suggests to me that those ideas could be incorporated into the not-for-profit side. Um, I, I, their entire vision was community-centric. Um, and so I would be surprised if there are not great ideas uh, that could be incorporated into their model through, particularly through the not-for-profit arm. Um, it just, it sort of, it fits with everything that they presented to us in terms of being a, uh, a community asset. Um, I, I don't see why they wouldn't. There, also to that point in their program plan for springtime in Red Houses, they said that spring as they're setting up, building out the infrastructure of the Paramount and starting to book acts in advance, that uh, one of their key points was to set up you know, forums with stakeholder and interest groups to get community feedback from what type of programming they'd like to see at the Paramount. So, yeah, so that's, they put that forward as kind of a spring, a spring plan. So, that's good. Yeah. I want to do two things. First of all, I want to thank everybody who came out, who uh, put in a proposal. I want to thank the committee who worked very hard in going through the proposals and came up with recommendations. And I also want to thank everyone who has consistently come not only to these work sessions, but as every council member knows, who has 
sent comments, <laughs> their questions, their concerns, anything, because that really, the ultimate goal is this is a decision that will affect this community for a very long time. So it's a very important decision that, that gets truly thought of and, and decided upon. But I want to thank everybody who's come out. Yeah, Jason, I can't say enough about Jason. <laughs> <laughs> over, and apparently, over thank you very no, much, Jason. I would not, <laughs> you get an, ex I an extra thank you. I will take all the responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> take yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. I guess the, the one point, I, I, I do know that we have local businesses that have done business with the old Paramount Board. And um, those businesses are important to the city of Peekskill. They're important to our business community. And part of um, my goal as the council sits and looks at a lease agreement with the new operator is, you know, are there, um, is there a willingness and an openness to, you know, looking at existing relationships to the extent that they are, they make sense? Do they factor into the future for the Paramount um, or not? And I know there was great competent staff at the Paramount as well. Um, and so it's, Having a, a good, sophisticated operator, having a good plan for how we work well together between um, the Paramount as both the venue but a business and our business community, but also respecting the hard work of uh, former business partners with the Paramount and employees is all important to the city. So we have not lost sight of that. And uh, we're hoping that old supporters of the uh, Paramount will continue to be supporters of the Paramount as it reemerges because I do think it will be very exciting, and we're hoping that all the supporters um, come along for the journey, because I think it will be a very exciting one. Well, I can tell you, Mary, that I brought up at our last work session in the town of Cortland that we've con been a contributing member of the uh, Paramount Significant every year. That support will continue. I can guarantee you that. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. But anyway, but I echo Mary Beth's comments. Thank you to everybody who continues to come out and offer their input yes. into this. Um, it's very, very much appreciated. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.